And we'd like to just consider, um, this is part two in our series, looking at the different empires uh, described in Daniel chapter two. And we'd like to just consider for a moment a couple of the words we looked at last week, which came from Second Peter chapter one, verse 16, where we read that we have not followed cunningly devised fables, says Peter, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So that's what Peter has to say, that we didn't follow a bunch of carefully cooked up fairy tales, is really what he's saying there. When they made known to the disciples and the, the different um, believers in the first century the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he goes on to say that we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed to, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And so the word of prophecy that is given to us throughout the, the Bible is something that is very sure and firm, and it is something that we can take great comfort in and instruction from. When we come to Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel gives the explanation of this great vision that he sees, he says in verse 28, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And what he sees is a vision that it has to do with this great iron image. So let's just read a little piece of this vision coming into Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, the great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. The form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image on his feet, which were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image uh, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And he says, we will tell the interpretation before the king. And this interpretation, of course, is the one that was given to him by God. And so he starts off and he says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for God hath of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And we considered that head of gold last week when we considered the vision uh, that was given to us in Daniel chapter 2, or not last week, a few weeks back. And we saw how that there was a progression of different uh, nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Europe, which is the, the progression through history. And he begins with Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, which would be the chest and arms of silver, and then the belly and the thighs of brass, the third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom, which shall be strong for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdues all things. And so this image would exist until along comes the little stone, he says in verse 43, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with clay, that's the last stage of the feet, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men and will not cleave one to another, as iron is not mixed with clay, 
And in the days of these kings, which is the toe kingdoms, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and that kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it's going to stand forever. So our focus this week, then, is to look at the Medo-Persian Empire, which is the chest and the arms of silver, and this is described as the kingdom that would arise after uh, Nebuchadnezzar that would be inferior to him. Now, when we look at the kingdom of Babylon, the Bible gives us clear reasons as to why it was going to be destroyed. In Daniel chapter 5, we read Belshazzar the great, or the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which had Father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines, might drink therein. And they brought out the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and of iron and of wood and stone. And of course, we know the story of Daniel chapter 5, that in the same hour that this was all going on with the, the vessels taken out of the temple, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick or the lampstand upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So this hand appears and it writes on the plaster against the candlestick or the lampstand. And of course the writing is mene mene tikal you farsen. And mene meaning God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And Perez thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and to the Persian, Persians in verses 25 to 28. So this is the situation where we left off in the last class where we looked at Babylon, and this is the last king of Babylon. He's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he's the son of Nabonidus, and he is a man who has not learned the lesson of his grandfather. And so the causes are given as to why this kingdom is going to be destroyed. And they're listed for us as pride, cruelty, and blasphemy. Now, if you just come over to Daniel chapter 4, over a couple of pages, we find in Daniel chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up in pride. Verse 30, he says, is, this, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom of the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Now, you'll just notice there that little brick up the very top of the screen, that brick sits in the uh, Oriental Institute in Chicago, and it has inscribed on it the name of Nebuchadnezzar, right onto the brick itself. And so this is the, the house that Nebuchadnezzar, or the, the great building or construction, Babylon, that he built, and he was proud. And of course, we read in this whole chapter, in chapter 4, how that God changed his visage and he became like a beast, and he ate uh, straw like the ox, and so on and so forth. And at the end of that, he recognized that it was God that ruled in the kingdom of men and gave it to whomsoever he would. But at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar's son and grandson didn't learn this lesson. So we read in Daniel chapter 5, verse 22, Thou his son, O Belshazzar, which is actually his grandson, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels out of his house before thee, and thou, thy lords, thy wives, and concubines, have drunk wine in them, and hast praised the gods of silver, and gold, and brass, iron, wood, and stone, that see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. So this is the unrepentant pride of Belshazzar, the son of, or grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, in that he brought the very vessels out of God's holy temple in Jerusalem, and he drank wine in them at this great drunken feast, and praised the gods of, and it's interesting that it's silver and gold and brass and iron, 
and stone, which of course are all the elements of this great image, and they're unrepentant. They haven't learned that great lesson. And so when we read about God's anger against Babylon, what we find is it's given to us in a couple of places, one of which is in Isaiah 47 and verse 7. Thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to heart, neither did remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures and dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and the great abundance of thine enchantments. So God chastises the Babylonian people and their king for their pride, their unrepentant pride, and the way that they lift themselves up. Now, it's also interesting that in this same chapter, uh, verse 6, just before this, God says that he was wroth with his people, he polluted his inheritance, and he gave them into thine hand. However, this great king showed no mercy, and upon the ancients thou hast laid a very heavy lo- uh, yoke. And so it was a cruel and repressive power, this Assyrio-Babylonian power, that would come against the children of Israel and would destroy them. And so the destruction is also told. That's some of the reasons why God would judge them the way he did. But the destruction of Babylon is also described to us. This, of course, is the Ishtar Gate, which now sits in Berlin. And um, this is the the gate, the very gate, which uh, Daniel would have walked through on his entrance into Babylon as a political prisoner. But just come, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 25. Because in Jeremiah 25, God gives us there the time frame of this nation, how long it would uh, subdue Israel. Chapter 25, and we come in at verse 11, and he says, This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith Yahweh, for their iniquity. And the land of the Chaldeans will I make a perpetual uh, desolation. So the, the land of Babylon or the, the kingdom of Babylon is given a time frame. And that time frame is a, is a finite period. It is a 70 year period. And after that point in time, God says that he's going to destroy it and he's going to make it a perpetual desolation. Well, exactly who would destroy it is described to us back in Isaiah. Come, if you would, to Isaiah 13, because here great detail is given throughout Isaiah and Jeremiah of how God is going to deal with this nation, with great Babylon. And he says in chapter 13 and verse 17, Behold, I will stir up the Medes, or the Medes as sometimes they're called, against them which shall not regard silver. Uh, as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. So here we see that the Medes are going to be a nation that are going to come against Babylon and are going to show no pity to them because as the principle of of Bible truth is laid out for us, with what judgment we judge, we will be judged. And the same is true of Babylon. And so not only does he tell them who is going to come, um, that it's going to be the Medes, but he actually names the very person who's going to lead them, which is in Isaiah chapter 45. So if you come over to Isaiah chapter 45, here we are given a very direct answer as to who this is going to be. Verse 1, Thus saith Yahweh to his anointed, to this man called Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings, that thou mayest know that I, Yahweh, which call thee by name, am God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Now, Isaiah is writing approximately 200 years before Cyrus would come along. 
and he's identifying him there. And this carving is one in uh, Persopolis, the capital city of uh, ancient Persia. And um, it is a carving of, what they believe, Cyrus himself. And so he's depicted there having multiple wings, uh, which had something to do with the deities of which they worshipped in the day. But not only does he tell them how that Cyrus would be the one, he's from the Medo-Persian nation really, but also how it would happen. Jeremiah 51, verse 13, he says, O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, the measure of thy covetousness. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance for thee. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up, for it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. So here God describes how that he's going to dry up the waters on which this great city of Babylon sits. Well, if you're still in Isaiah, he says there, um, this is actually not 45, it should be... No, it's the next passage I'm looking for. But anyway, uh, we can find this verse later on. But he says this. It could be Jeremiah as well. I'll have to find it for you. Um, But this is what he says of um, how he would go about doing this. He says, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two lead gates. Uh, The gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, I will give thee the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, Yahweh, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. So here is the one who is going to come, and he says that he's going to loose the loins of kings. It is actually, sorry, Isaiah 45. I just missed the first part of the verse. So um, it is this King Cyrus who's going to come, and God says that he's going to open the gates before him, and he's going to break and sunder these gates. So the waters will be dried up, and the gates are going to be opened in front of him so that he's going to know that it's God is the one who is giving him this great victory. Now, if you come over to Jeremiah chapter 51, he also describes the state of the palace in this time of great calamity. Jeremiah 51 and verse 37 gives you the context. He says, Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons and so on. But he says in verse 39, in their heat, I will make their feasts and I will make them drunken that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and shall not wake, saith Yahweh. So here's an interesting passage. It's one of our proof passages for the immortality of the soul not being a biblical doctrine, because here these people are going to sleep a perpetual sleep. So when they die, they go into the ground, and they're not going to be raised again. But he's talking about the destruction of Babylon and those that are enjoined into this great feast. He says, I'm going to make them drunk. So they'll be destroyed in their drunkenness. Now, one of the passages we'd like to look at in regards to this is back in Isaiah, and I apologize for kind of doing the dance between Isaiah and Jeremiah, but it's kind of, this is where the scriptures are. So Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and this is the description of Lucifer. How are there fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And of course, Lucifer simply means the day star. How are there cut down to the ground, for thou didst weaken the nations? And when you look at this, you say, well, what is this talking about? Now, if you just glance back at verse 4 in chapter 14, he says, Take up the proverb, this proverb, against the king of Babylon, and say, How the oppressor ceased, and the golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. So this is a proverb against the king of Babylon, and he describes him as Lucifer, like the day star. The brightest star, first thing in the morning, you can see, but once the sun arises, it's obliterated. It's no longer visible. So it's only there for a short period of time. He says, Thou shalt say in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And he goes on to say, thou art cast out as the, uh, out of the grave like an abominable branch, and thy raiment, as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword, that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden underfoot. So this is talking about Belshazzar. He is the king of Babylon, and Babylon would be destroyed. And it's describing here how he would die. He'll be lifted up in his heart in pride, which we saw in that great feast. And so the prophet says, you're going to be thrown out of your grave like an abominable branch. You're not going to have a proper royal burial but rather you're going to be thrust through with the sword and cast aside and trodden underfoot. And that's how this great king of Babylon would die. Well, just back one more page in chapter 13 and verse 19, it tells us of the complete destruction of Babylon. It says, Babylon, the glory of the Chaldees, our kingdom, sorry, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall be never, it never shall be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, and so on and so forth. It'll be a house of dragons and of doleful creatures, and so on and so forth. So that's the picture of the complete destruction of Babylon that would take place. And that uh, photograph there is an aerial flyby of what is left of Babylon today, and it is literally uh, a desolation. So just a summary then of those prophecies that are given. It would last Babylon, that is, for 70 years. It would be overthrown by the Medo-Persians. A man named Cyrus would lead the attack. The waters of Babylon would be dried up. The gates of the city would be left open. The palace would be in a drunken state. The king would be killed by the sword and tossed into a common grave, trodden underfoot, and it would bring about the eventual total destruction of this place. So let's then look at the conqueror of Babylon, this Cyrus the Persian. And we'd like just to go to Daniel chapter 7, because in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 2 is the, the metals of the image, but chapter 7 gives us the animation, I guess you could say, of the beast describing uh, the Medes and the Persians. And what Daniel saw, as we looked at last time in chapter 7, verse 16, I came near to one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this, and he told me and made me to know the interpretation of the thing. Uh, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings that would arise out of the earth. And our focus is going to be on the, the bear that is described to us there. It's another beast, a second, like a bear, that is raised up itself on one side, it had three ribs in the mouth of, between the teeth of it, and they said unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. So this is the great system that would arise, this next empire. We have the Babylonian Empire to start with, and we're focusing now on one of its provinces, which is the province of the Medes and the Persians. And as all great calamities uh, and, and rebellions usually begin, it's all about tax revolt. That's what it was for Alexander the Great later on. Uh, that's what it was for the Americans, tossing the tea in the harbor in Boston. And uh, that's sort of what this is all about. It's a tax revolt. They're under the boot of, the, uh, of the, the Babylonians, that's the Medes and the Persians, and eventually they just get fed up of it, and they don't want to be under their boot anymore. Um, so they launch a rebellion. And it comes out of... Um, the, uh, the Persian Empire, and um, they're a multicultural people. There are Medes and there are Persians. And in fact, you can see here the round headed um, headpiece there, that's a Mede, and the square headed piece is a Persian soldier. So the Medes and the Persians. And they're made up of two peoples that worked very closely together because they had a common enemy. And so here is a couple of the Persians. And here's some of the Medes. And like all great intrigues, it really began with the intermarriage of uh, a family um, between the Medo Empire and the Persian Empire. So Astages was the king of the Medes, and uh, that's a, a relief of him. Uh, they believe this is from his tomb in, um, I'm not going to say exactly where, I can't remember the name of it or pronounce it, it's in Persia. And he had two children, a woman named Mandane and a son named Darius, and sometimes called Cyaxares in history. 
and Mandane was married off as a political alliance to Cambyses, the king of the Persians. And their son was Cyrus, who would be eventually the king of the Medes and the Persians. So this, this political marriage is two dynasties coming together, two empires united in the man Cyrus. And so the Medes and the Persians, as they're depicted here, two very distinct nations became one, united in revolt against um, the, uh, the Babylonians. And so it was that Cyrus set off to Ecbatana. Uh, he leaves, it wasn't actually Persopolis, but we're going to call it Persopolis per se, that the capital city hadn't been built yet. And he travels up to a place called Ecbatana. That was the capital city of the Medes. And he picks up his uncle there, Cyaxares, or Darius. And his uncle's much older than he is, obviously. Um, he's about 60, and Cyrus is, is somewhere around the, the age of uh, 30. And they go off together to fight the army of the Babylonians. Now, the army of the Babylonians is at a place called Gordium, and they, they trace through the, uh, the Armenian wilderness, I guess you could call it, and they, they end up in this place called Gordium, where they fight this massive battle. And I, massive is to say the least, because... Each side has approximately 500,000 troops. So when you think about the Gulf War, America and all its allies totaled 500,000 troops in the whole of Saudi Arabia. This is a five-mile stretch where this Babylon or this army is set in array. They are drastically outnumbered. So the Babylonian army consists of 120,000 elite infantry, which are right in the middle. So you can see them up here in the middle. Then they had 120,000 infantry on either side. These were mercenaries. Behind them, they had 30,000 cavalry. And um, that was their, the, the total of their host. So you've got 360, uh, 400 plus thousand people on that one side of the army. Now, Cyrus and the Medes, with the Persians combined, are scraping together uh, 126,000 troops. Um, they have about 40,000 archers and pikes. Um, there are 2,000 of the elite infantry. Now, Cyrus uh, has another strategy. He puts all his best soldiers at the back, and their job is that if anybody gets afraid and wants to run away, they have to murder their own men or kill their own men to stop them from running away. So if you were sort of intent on chickening out from this battle, you feared usually your own elite soldiers more than you did the enemy itself. So he put the elite soldiers at the back. Behind them, there were towers with archers. Now these towers were pulled like chariots, but they were, they were built right up high and the archers would be up in the top of those and they would shoot down from above. And um, then behind that, he put the baggage. So all the, the, the cooks and, and uh, anybody that was brought along that was sort of support, he threw them into the battle as well, just to make his numbers look a little bigger, because he was drastically outnumbered. I mean, he really only had about 170,000, uh, 180,000 troops. So he's outnumbered two to one. Um, he had some cavalry on either side, about 13,000. Um, and had about uh, 100 war chariots on either flank as well, and 100 war chariots in the front. And then he had camels. He had about 300 camels that he just kind of threw in there. They had carried the baggage, and um, there were, um, they used to mount Egyptians, usually would go on the camels. One would face one direction, one would face the other and they would shoot arrows from both sides. But he was just throwing everything into this mix, because you can see he's drastically outnumbered. In fact, very easily for them to pull a pincer movement on him where he would be outflanked. So the battle was set in array, and uh, what happened was um, it was a near disaster at first, because exactly what we described, both sides, the cavalry and the infantry, start to encircle Cyrus's army. So on this side here, they break right the way through, and uh, his chariots come out to defend, but there's, there's way more chariots over here. And um, Cyrus's war chariots come through here, and uh, they try to basically break through the, the lines. 
But the elite troops of the Persians, or sorry, the, the Babylonians, managed to break through his lines, but only get as far as the baggage. And so, for all intents and purposes, things look like they're going pretty bad. However, um, the secret weapon to all this, and this is how God works, is the camels, the 300 or 200 camels. can't remember exactly how many there was. It was about two or 300. They went out first against the cavalry. Well, Cyrus's army had been marching with these camels for some time. And it is a well-known fact that horses cannot stand the smell of camels. And so when these camels, which you know, are rather funny looking things anyway, um, that make some rather revolting noises, as they come charging out at the chariots, the chariot horses, uh, the cavalry, sorry, the cavalry all here, turn around and absolutely in panic, um, the horses, that is, turn back and overrun their own soldiers because these camels that have come against them have terrified them and they stampede back over their own soldiers and they flatten all these guys here so that Cyrus is able to make a pincer movement and bring his guys around and cover them at the back. And so what ends up happening is the, the Medo-Persian uh, left flank completely and absolutely fails and um, I guess that's the right flank. The right flank completely fails and uh, he's able to bring his soldiers around and they kind of wheel around and now they create their own pincer movement and basically they defeat this massive army of the, the Babylonians. But of course, it was in God's plan and it was by the use of these camels, unbeknownst to them, uh, that God was able to hand them this victory. And so that took place at Gordium and uh, they went on from here uh, to Sardis, where the, the captain of this great force was encircled. And it was at this place that he capitulated. And uh, Cyrus, again, um, not being one to, uh, not having a very large army, he sort of gave the soldiers that were there the choice. I mean, a lot of these are mercenaries. So they're, whether they're Greeks or Egyptians or whatever they would be. And so he said, look, um, we could kill you all or you could join us. And so they said, let's think about that. Okay, we'll join you. And so they, they changed sides in this battle. They joined Cyrus and his forces. And Cyrus made their leader one of his generals. And so out they went then um, to fight the rest of the Babylonians. So on the way home, Cyrus uh, swung by Babylon, disguised himself, went into the city, kind of surveyed it, and um, then returned to Ecbatana, the capital city, of the, the Medes, where they basically wintered and they prepared for the battle the next spring when they would come back to Babylon and lay siege to Babylon itself. Now, we looked briefly in our last talk together um, at the city of Babylon. It was a massive city. Um, we read about in, in uh, Jeremiah how the, the waters would be dried up. A great river went through the whole thing, the river Euphrates. It sat upon that great river. And so the Babylonians had a complete supply of water. And there was walls all the way along this river. Very high walls that were very difficult to climb up. And uh, big gates all the way along so that you couldn't get into the city. In fact, the walls were so wide around the outside of Babylon that you could ride a chariot with five horses abreast around the top of those walls. That's how big this city was. And so it was that... Um, it was impregnable for all intents and purposes. And here you can see a, um, a, a schematic of it here. The city itself was quite huge. And um, even if you did come up the river, you couldn't get through those great gates and those walls that surrounded it. So Cyrus's army encircled the city, trapping the inhabitants in it. And um, what they proceeded to do was to build a siege ditch. So his armies came along and they spent quite a considerable amount of time digging this huge trench all the way around this great city. Now, the people inside the city thought this was the funniest thing because they had a permanent supply of water. Um, they had grain supplies for some 20 years, it's estimated. And so they just laughed. They said, there's no way that you're going to starve us out of the city. And that's the context of the feast that Belshazzar holds. He holds the feast during the siege. It is a sort of laugh in your face at those armies that have come against him. And so it's in the middle of that that he has this great vision 
uh, well, not a vision, he sees the hand writing upon the wall, and um, he brings out Daniel, of course, the queen um, suggests that Daniel should come out, and it's believed it was the queen mother, and um, Daniel comes out, and he gives the interpretation, and uh, the king commands Belshazzar, um, or king commanded Belshazzar that they clothe Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. The reason he's third ruler is because Belshazzar himself is only the second ruler. Um, the, the first ruler is, is Nabonidus, who is his father, and Nabonidus is off at this point in time um, collecting gods from all the different nations that he has subdued and putting them in one of the, uh, the, the religious cities, the holy cities of Babylon. So Daniel's comment, of course, is, you know, give your gifts to somebody else. It doesn't matter because you're done. Um, the hands come, it's written on the wall, and uh, it's all going to be over. So remember the words of Isaiah, that before him, the two-leave gates would be opened. Well, it just happened that that night, because of the drunken stupor, that while the invasion is going on, and these troops are all around the outside, that the guards did not lock those gates that go up the river. And so um, what Cyrus did was he brought his guards on the inside of the river, or of the ditch, that is. Um, instead of usually on a siege, you would stand on the other side of the ditch and nobody can escape. And the idea is anybody tries to, you either murder them, capture them, or enslave them, or whatever you're going to do. But he puts his soldiers all on the inside of the ditch. And remember the words of Jeremiah, that her sea would be dried up. He would dry up her sea and make her springs dry, bring a drought upon her waters. So what Cyrus did was actually, these are not siege ditches. Their job was to um, take the waters, he diverted the waters so that they would run around the outside of the city. And then they could walk up through the channel of the dry river bed now and go inside the city, which is exactly what they did. And so in Daniel chapter 5, at the end of the chapter, it tells us that that very night that this all had taken place with the handwriting upon the wall in verse 31, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. And you say, well, how come it's Darius the Median, since it was Cyrus the Persian that brought about this whole um, attack? Well, um, it's uh, Rollins in his book, The Ancient History of Babylon, and well, it's Rollins' Ancient History, and he deals with Cyrus and Babylon and Alexander. He tells us, he was the one who gave us that family tree, that Darius was Cyrus's uncle. Cyrus is a young man, he's very ambitious, and he's off uh, conquering, and Nabonidus is still out on the lamb, he still has to be taken care of. So he installs Darius, his uncle, who's 62 years old, in Babylon to rule from there, and uh, he says, you rule Babylon, I'm off to take care of the rest of the empire. And so it is that Darius um, comes and becomes the king over the Babylonians for a period of time. So just uh, over time, though, that river that had been diverted around the outside of the city ate away at the foundations, and the city pretty much collapsed. It became a swamp for a period of time, um, and uh, today it is literally a ruin. And uh, there is nothing much left of it. In fact, I meant to find the slide. I've got it of um, Iraq, where uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was rebuilding this, trying to build an amusement park there and make it a tourist destination, and had some great big statues of himself dressed up like Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and, uh, of course, that all went south with the Great Gulf War. So Medo-Persia itself, then, becomes the great empire now that would rule over the whole world, and it's centered out of two capitals, really, Persopolis, which was the city of Cyrus, uh, that he had commissioned and built, and the other one you're familiar with is Susa, or Shushan, the palace, um, the palace city uh, of the, uh, the Medes and the Persians. So one's kind of the summer city, and one is the winter city. And here is what it looks like. This is what the empire would be by the time it was done, right the way up into what is Turkey today and into the Balkans there, uh, all the way down into Egypt and down very far south into what would be uh, the borders of Ethiopia. 
and um, all the way across Persia, as it's known to us today, Iran, or Iraq right here, Iran right here, all the way down, right bordering up to the Hindu Valley, which is India, and up into the north, into Afghanistan, and taken in Armenia. Um, so it was a pretty massive territory, all said and done. And so this was the beast uh, that would arise. It was that third beast, like a bear. Where is it? There it is. And um, what we're told is that it had three ribs in its mouth between the teeth of it. And it is told to arise and devour much flesh. And the reason there is three ribs, if you come over to Daniel chapter 6, is because when we read here in Daniel chapter 6, when Darius assumes control over the kingdom, we find there that it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes who should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the kings thought to set him over the whole realm. So here Daniel then becomes, of course, king, or not king, but president over this whole area. He's well into his 80s at this point in time. This is very late in life. And of course, he's promoted and he is trusted by the king, which only brings one result from men, and that is envy and jealousy. And of course, we have the story of Daniel chapter 6, which is Darius, the Mede, Cyrus's uncle, who gets trapped into this whole issue of prayer. And um, nobody was to pray but to his God. And of course, Daniel refuses to do this. And he goes to his window as he'd done before and prays towards Jerusalem and consequently is taken and is put into the lion's den. And so we read there in Daniel chapter 6, verse 15, uh, Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree or statute uh, which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake unto him, and said unto Daniel, the God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And so, brothers and sisters, um, if we think we hit our 80s and our trials are over, guess again. Because this is when Daniel goes into the pit uh, with the lions. He's something like 87 to 90 years old at this point in time. So he's in there. And of course, we know the story how that God closes the mouths of the lions and Daniel is preserved. And in fact, it's interesting because in Shushan the palace, or Susa, there is what is called today even the tomb of Daniel. Because this empire was a very sophisticated empire that lasted many, many years. It was followed by the Greek empire, and um, they built this tomb of Daniel, where it's believed that Daniel's remains are entombed somewhere in there. Um, just interesting, though, that there's a testimony to this great man all these years later, that it is still recognized, no different than the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron, that we have this monument to the truth um, and the things that took place and to the prophecies that were there. Well, Cyrus himself is an interesting individual. Um, he's a Zoroastrian. It's the religion of the Persians, and it's alive and well today. There are still Zoroastrians. Um, a good friend of mine who, God willing, is coming to uh, Winter Bible School, Andrew White, married a Persian girl um, who had come into the truth. And her uh, religion uh, before that was she was a Zoroastrian because she was Persian. So it's a very ancient religion, still in existence to today. And um, a little bizarre, but it is nonetheless what it is. Darius, though, the, the great, this is his tomb. It's quite a massive uh, construction carved out of the wall, similar to the Nabataeans did down in Petra. And uh, it stands there as a, a testimony to Darius the Great as well. And um, there are other uh, kings that have their tombs there as well as Darius. So it's very interesting, though, that Cyrus, of course, who would then become king following the death of Darius, would put together a decree to send the people back to the land. And this was found in Cyrus's tomb uh, near Persopolis. 
And he says, I am Cyrus, king of the universe, the great king, the powerful king, king of Babylon, king of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four quarters of the world, son of Cambyses, the great, king of the cities of Anshan. When I went as harbinger of peace, that is, into Babylon, I founded my sovereign residence within the palace amid celebration and rejoicing, my vast troops were marching peaceably into Babylon, and the whole of Sumer and Akkad had nothing to fear. I sought the safety of the city of Babylon and its all its sanctuaries. As for the population of Babylon, who, as if without divine intervention, had endured a yoke, not decreed of them, he says, um, I soothed their weariness, I fed them, or freed them, sorry, from their bonds, from Susanna or Shushan, I went back to the places of their, uh, I sent back to their places to the city of Asher and Susa, the sanctuaries across the river Tigris, whose shrines had early been dilapidated, because this is what Nabonidus was doing. He was running around stealing all the gods and hoarding them to himself. He says, The gods who lived therein and made permanent sanctuaries for them, I collected all their people and returned them to their settlements and their gods. Uh, which Nabonidus, to the fury of the Lord of gods, had brought into Shushana. Um, and I command, as com- or at the command of Marduk, the great Lord, I returned them unharmed to their cells in the sanctuaries that made them happy. May all the gods that I return to their sanctuaries every day before Bel and Nabu ask a long life for me and mention my good deeds. Now that's what's put right on the cylinder. But if you just turn in your Bible over to Ezra... We have the decree that Cyrus gave concerning the Jews. So this is the time period that we've just sort of been through. And if you look at Ezra, in uh, chapter 1, we find there, it's the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus say Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, God of heaven, hath given me all kingdoms of the earth, and hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Yahweh, God of Israel. Uh, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And uh, he tells them to heap upon them silver and gold and goods and beasts, and the free will offering uh, for the house of God that's in Jerusalem. So exactly what's on that cylinder about him returning all the gods to their countries, we have a portion of that in the Bible where he gives the actual decree to send the Jews back to Babylon, back from Babylon to Jerusalem to build their city in the city of their God. And so it's an amazing thing how that Bible prophecy and archaeology corroborate one another. We have that in the text. Remember the words of Peter, we haven't followed a bunch of made-up fairy tales. This is the truth that we have before us. So just spending a couple of minutes just to look at the, uh, the great palace um, at Passagard. It's the audience ha- hall of Cyrus's capital. You can see here these great big columns and uh, these great big marble flagstones that are all the way throughout. This was an absolutely massive construction. Um, These were very advanced people. In fact, it's taken them a long time to even figure out how they built these great big uh, cities. The tomb of Cyrus, of course, is there at Passagard, um, or Passargad, I guess it is. And um, this is where that cylinder was found, and it's still preserved today. So here's another person from the Bible who is a historical figure, and you can go to Iran, well, maybe not recommended, but you possibly could have in the past have gone to Iran, and you can go and visit the tomb of Cyrus. It's there today. Stands as a monument to the truth. Now, it's interesting, too, because we also read about Shushan the palace. When we come to Nehemiah, just over a few pages, from Ezra to Nehemiah now, Nehemiah, of course, was in Shushan the palace. And in Shushan the palace, there are these wall carvings. And uh, these are from Shushan. They're very colorful. They have been restored. These ones, I believe, were in the the museum in in Chicago. 
And um, this is the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So this is the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace. But he goes on to say in chapter 2, it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, the wine was brought before him, and I took the wine, of course, he was sad in his presence. Well, this is this great uh, palace at Shushan, and there is the carvings, and the, or the painted mosaics, or whatever you want to call them, I'm not quite sure, reliefs, that are on the walls, were on the walls of Shushan the palace, and you can go to Chicago today, and you can see the very same thing. It's there today. And so this is Bible prophecy and archaeology coming hand in hand in just basic history to prove to us that this isn't stories, this is true. Uh, at Persopolis, this is the palace structure. It's in a massive structure that they have spent some time recently um, excavating. And just to give you an idea of how really massive this is, you can see the people um, that are walking along. You can just make them out. Um, I believe it's right about there. There's a, there's a person standing, a couple of people there. That's the size. There's another person there next to some of these columns. That's the size of this palace structure. Now, archaeology and uh, architectural students all over the place have had a heyday with this and have tried to do some reconstructions of sort of what it would look like. And here's some of their ideas of, of the size of these columns and the roofs that they would hold up. Because the roofs were all made of wood, um, so when this was burnt down years later by Alexander the Great, all the roof structure was destroyed, um, but the columns remained standing. The outside walls were also crumbled away and used for other things, but it wasn't like you could just borrow one of those columns if you wanted to do some redecorating at home. It would take you an army of elephants to move one. So this is the front gate at Persopolis, and uh, the famous stairs that run up. And uh, this is a reconstruction of what the gate would have been like. There's two of the bulls that they believe would have stood there. The gate of the nations is what it's called. And um, there's a different depiction of the same thing. But if you go to Persopolis today and you walk around, you can see it. It's preserved. And um, here's just to give you an idea. Here's one of the bases of these columns that sit at the entrance of this. And um, that column itself is about four or five feet tall. Here is a soldier standing beside it, um, just to give you an idea of the size of the base. Well, into that went the massive column itself. So these were absolutely colossal structures. The royal harem, um, remember of course that Esther was taken to the royal harem. This was at Shushan the palace uh, in the days of Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. And it was in the days of Ahasuerus who sat upon his throne of his kingdom, he was in Shushan the palace, and all the princes of the power of Medes and the Persians came to him into this great feast that had taken place. So here is um, the Gate of the Nations, which is still standing today. And uh, here is a reconstruction of it to give you an idea of the size of those beasts as they are, they are there. So this is a massive construction of, of immense proportions. And in fact, if you were to go to Chicago, this is the, uh, the great horse head, one of the horses, and I'll just show you where they sit. Um, there are some of them here. There's like these great big horse heads that sit on top of these pillars. If I can just find one of the, uh, I might not have it. There they are. Sorry, next one. At the very top of the columns, there are these massive heads that sit at the top of those columns. And they were painted, of course, later on. But this will give you an idea, and there's some bull's heads there as well. Um, just a minute. This is There's a way of skipping by all of this, but I haven't quite figured that out in this new version. There they are. Uh, so that's in Chicago. And you can just see Chafin, who's standing on the ground at the bottom there. Um, that's the size of this massive construction. Um, and this is actually not a horse head, it's the bull head that we saw there. So these are the, the, uh, the bulls from uh, Persopolis. So it just gives you an idea of what you're dealing with. And just by the way, here's an incidental thing. Um, in the Chicago Institute, one of the things that they dug up 
was this ram's head. And um, it was one of the, the deities of the Persians was a ram. And they, they wore this headdress. And it's very similar to the headdress that Cyrus was wearing in that depiction of him on the wall with the wings. It's a ram, though. That's how they depicted themselves. So when you think of the Americans using the eagle, well, the Persians used the ram. And what does the Bible use in Daniel chapter 8 when it wants to depict the Persian Empire versus the Greek Empire? It uses a ram with two horns, one lifted up on one side more than the other. So there is the picture of the Persians. So when we come to the Bible, when we look at these things and we read the stories of Esther and Nehemiah and Daniel, these are real places and you can go to these places today, uh, maybe you know, not right now, um, but I know Brother John Ramston has visited many of them when he was a much younger man and traveling through the Middle East and actually was able to go to these places and take pictures and you know, witness firsthand some of these great archaeological sites that are a testimony to the truth of the Bible. But of course the story doesn't end there because in Ezekiel chapter 38 um, there is a mention once again of Persia. Just come to Ezekiel chapter 38. Now this is the latter days. Because remember, Daniel chapter 2 is about the vision of what the king would see in the latter days. So there has to be a Persian element uh, that still is there in the latter days. And we find in Ezekiel chapter 38 and in verse 4, he says to Gog, I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, uh, all of them with shield and helmet. So Persia is uh, what we know today as Iran. And um, what do we find in the news? This just happened to be tonight's news headline from a place called Press TV. And the headline was, Iran and Russia boost ties. So the story reads that Iran and Russia have both rejected the use of force as a solution to the crisis in Syria, calling for an end of bloodshed in the Arab country. And it goes on and on about how they're working together to uh, try and ensure that there is no Western intervention in the, uh, the area. But this is very close following this big deal that was made with Iran over the nuclear uh, armament program in Iran and Russia, both of them working very closely together. So that's what we expect to see. The story of Iran is not finished, or Persia. It's going to be there, part of this great conglomeration in the latter day, as we read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35, that then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together. And it's going to be consumed and uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it is going to stand forever. So that's what we look forward to, is all these kingdoms of men, which have been these great glorious empires um, that have oppressed at different times God's people, the time is coming when they're going to be wiped away, and the kingdom of God is going to be established on this earth instead. And so that's what we're looking forward to. How do we know that it's true? Well, because the words that he's spoken about, all these empires throughout the ages have come to pass in great detail, described for us, laid out for us, and history and archaeology both stand as a testimony to them, and even prophecy current, where we see Russia and Iran pulling together and uniting themselves against the West and against Israel. So we can be assured then, as Peter told us, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables. These aren't a bunch of stories, but we have the clear and absolute word of God laid out for us that we can put our trust and our confidence in. So God willing, next uh, year, I guess it will be by now, um, we'll look at the Greek Empire and see the story of Alexander the Great as he comes to uh, mop up the, the rest of the Medo-Persian Empire and bring about the next in the series, which is going to be the belly and the thighs of brass or the, the four-headed, four-winged leopard. So God willing, that will be, if we're still here by then, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't returned next year when we will consider that subject.